All right, well, it's good to see all you here. I appreciate you coming out, and I appreciate what you're going to do with this after you learn it. Amen? Just before we get started, I do want to just tell you that I appreciate you inviting me down, and I appreciate being here. We uh, tried to come earlier this year. I ran into a passport problem. My passport disappeared. It was retrieved, and obviously, <laughs> so, but um, it um, usually, and, and I, don't, I don't like to let the devil determine how good a meeting is, but sometimes you can kind of tell when he really fights about you going somewhere that it's probably going to be a good meeting. You know, I don't know if you just get mad about it and just plow through or what, but uh, one thing I did want to mention before we get started, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are familiar with it or not, but if not, you should study it because it's your heritage. But back about 1923, 22 and 23, and then again in 27, uh, Smith Wigglesworth was in this area. And actually, he actually prophesied that the last great revival was going to start and finish in South Australia. Amen? Now, I just got back from South Africa, and it was amazing. I could spend the next three days just giving you testimonies of what took place there. Uh, we saw things that very honestly, we hadn't seen in years and some things we had never seen before. And there is something that has happened recently in the spirit realm that everything's got turned up. And so this week, um, it's going to be a DHT as usual, meaning the material is as usual, but it's not going to be a meeting as usual. Amen? So <clears throat> we want... We want to make sure that what God is doing in an area, that we're not standing around watching it, but that we want to be the people that God uses to do it. Amen? And so I firmly believe, and, and I say this with all, uh, how can I say, just bluntness, okay? I really believe that several times you can see moves of God and God will start something, and then the people wouldn't pick it up and run with it. And what he wanted to do didn't see the fruition of what he really wanted to do. But I really believe that in times past, the different messages that have been brought forth, you know, everything comes line upon line, so to speak. Revelation is laid out a little at a time. Very few people jump in head first and just get it all. It usually has to be built up over a period of time. Sometimes over a period of generations. Because you have to get used to a bit of revelation and then walk in it. And then more revelation comes and then you get used to that. And then you walk in it and it comes little by little. But I really believe and, and <clears throat> there are certain messages that are conducive to God working. And there are certain messages that are not conducive, even though they may come through Christian ministers. They're not conducive to God working. You know, how many of you know that sometimes we're our own worst enemy, right? We get in, we get in God's way by just getting in our own way sometimes. <clears throat> if you have heard this message before, then you know it's vastly different from what the church has taught, I don't want to say traditionally, because this is traditional Bible. But it's different from what has been taught in the church about healing. It's vastly different. And the reason it's so different is because it is Bible. Right? At which those two shouldn't go together, but they tend to sometimes. And the message that has been out there concerning healing specifically generally has gone back to a person being anointed, being gifted, something along those lines. Okay, this is not that message. I really firmly believe, I've studied the Bible, I'm 51 now, I started studying it when I was about six. My mom taught me how to read, reading the Bible, the King James Bible. And so I've been studying it pretty much now ever since. 
But one of the things that I've noticed is that I know that in the end times, which we are in, obviously, because Peter said this was that, and that Joel prophesied, and we're still in those end times, and because of that, the, the purpose of what is generally called the fivefold ministry is to train and equip believers to do the work of the ministry. Right? Now, the fivefold ministry, they are the trainers, they're the coaches, they're the teachers, they're the ones that teach the believers how to go out on the streets, witness, minister healing, you know, all of the, the work of the ministry. And I know from, from just scripture that eventually, according to Ephesians chapter 4 especially, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is to grow up the body of Christ into Christ. Right? That's not the message that has gone out in times past concerning healing. In times past, it was not about the body growing up. It was about emphasis or a spotlight was on a man, was on an anointing, was on a gift. That's why I said, this isn't that message. I believe with all my heart, and like I said, I've studied every move of God literally from the book of Acts on. I believe that if there was ever a message that could help start what is generally referred to today as a saint's movement, this is that message. Because this does not go back to a person, and especially not any one person other than the person of Jesus Christ. This is about believers giving glory to God and believing what the Bible says and just acting like it's true and doing that everywhere they go. So the emphasis is not the healing service on Saturday night, even though we're going to have one, even though people are going to get healed. That's not the emphasis. Matter of fact, I don't usually tell you this ahead of time, but I'll go ahead and mention it, and that way we'll just weed some of you out. <clears throat> that's, that's why I don't generally tell you from the beginning. Usually if I tell you from the beginning, some of you won't show up Saturday night. Saturday night, I intend on ministering to the sick. But the whole purpose of Saturday night is not to give me a chance to minister to the sick. I get that opportunity all the time. The purpose of Saturday night in the healing service is to give you a chance to minister to the sick. That's the activation time, if you want to call it that. That's whenever you get to put into practice what you've been learning for three days. See, it does no good for me to come to a place like this and teach three days that you can do it. And then Saturday, make you sit there and watch me do it. Because that totally undoes everything I've taught. So we just give you a chance to minister. We'll show you how to do it. We'll walk you through it. And for many of you, it may be the first time you've ever seen God actually heal a person after you've laid hands on them. If that's true, then you definitely want to be here, right? Because this is your breakout moment. Now, I fully expect, I'm, of course, I live in the States. I'm hardly ever there anymore, but I, that's where I live. <clears throat> we just had a new granddaughter about uh, two months ago. Uh, March 3rd, I think it was, she was born. I was there about a week, two weeks. Then I went to South Africa for three weeks. Then I was back home for 10 days. And then I came here for three weeks. And when I get back, I have to I have about two weeks at home. I have a conference. And then I go on the road in the States for over a month. And so I am not getting to see my new granddaughter because I'm here. So you better do something with this. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> I'm not wasting me missing my granddaughter. <laughs> so you can sit and hear a seminar. Amen? This is not just a seminar. I... I I will prove to you from the word of God. This is the word of God. This is the message the apostles preached. This is why they got the results they did. And this is why you'll get results. Amen? <clears throat> we have taught this now. We have trained, I think at last count. When we quit counting, it was a little over 40,000 people that we had trained. The average person sees, and we get reports in, that's how I know this. But the average person gets about 30 to 33 healings per month, right, that they're recording. Now, it's amazing because this works for anybody, right? You don't have to be gifted. You don't have to be, quote, unquote, anointed the way you think, right? You don't have to be a good speaker. 
I will prove that to you as we go along, <laughs> okay? <clears throat> I've been informed I don't speak English, I speak Texan, all right? So, <clears throat> but you didn't come here for an English lesson. You came here to know how the power of God works. Amen? Now, I'll be honest with you. The only thing I bring to the table, and probably the only reason God uses me, is just perseverance. Honestly. I'm not gifted. I'm not special. I don't, you know, none of that stuff. I just refuse to quit. I won't back down. I won't quit. I won't back off. We just keep on going, and I hate to lose. <laughs> Amen? Especially when this book tells me I'm supposed to win. It makes a world of difference. And so, over the next couple of days, we're going to take you through, well, I was going to tell everybody, it's funny because I was going to ask you how many of you had your manual, and I'm looking on here, and I don't see the word manual on here. That's good. This isn't your manual. This is your workbook. This is your manual. You understand? <clears throat> this is what counts. No matter what you read anywhere else. They asked Smith Wigglesworth one time, what, what can you recommend a good book to read on healing? He said, yes, four of them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> All right? Now, so I firmly believe that what we're going to do this week, this is a, I really, uh, you don't, if you've been, how many of you have been to a DHT before or heard it on CD or MP3? Okay, all right. You've never heard me say this before because I don't usually talk this way. I do know this message works and it works for everybody that puts it into practice. Right? It's real simple. Now, the amazing thing about it, about these meetings, and this is the part you've never heard me say before because I've never said it. I believe that God has earmarked these meetings to begin the, or to be, the ignition of something that's going to take place here in South, South Australia. Now, I believe that with all my heart. Now, I, if you keep hearing me say South Africa, when I mean Australia, I'm sorry, I just got back from there, so it rolls off the tongue fairly easy. But I do believe that God, now, I know he always wants to do something, and his spirit is always moving, and it's us who many times are not in step with what he's doing. But I firmly believe that these meetings, I believe, and I, I can't speak for you, but I do know this, that if you will take what you learned during these meetings and you put it into practice and you refuse to back off, you prove it to yourself from the word that it is the word of God, I believe that there will come a time that you'll be able to point back and say, I was there when it started. And I believe that'll be the move of God across Australia, very possibly like it's never been seen before. Amen? Now, <clears throat> the reason I'm saying that is because in times past, people have always looked forward to a man of God coming because of the general perception of the anointing that is on that man. And many of you that know me, and probably the better you know me, the less you expect that. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but you know that's... You know, I didn't come here to be the guy, right? I didn't come here to be the man and be the one, you know, the, the anointed one to come in here. And do, that's, that's, am I anointed? Yes, so are you. But am I called to, a, to an office in the church? Yes, I'm fulfilling that office. At the same time, this isn't about any of us. This is about Jesus Christ. This is about Australia seeing Jesus the way he should be represented and in his fullness and in his glory. Amen? Amen. Now, that means, and, and I'm not against anything except or unless that's all you do. You say, well, what are you talking about? I'm not against any manifestations unless that's all you do. A manifestation should somehow always point back to the glory of God. And every time Jesus mentioned seeing the glory of God, somebody got healed, somebody got raised from the dead, there was some type of deliverance. It wasn't just goosebumps and gold dust. 
Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not against, I understand, I'm not against gold dust. I'm not against goosebumps. I'm not against any of that stuff. All I'm going to say is, you know, there was an old saying in the old Pentecostal circles. It's not how high you jump, it's how straight you walk after you land. For the world to see Jesus, there are going to be certain things that have to come back into effect in the church. Number one, if we're going to grow up into Christ in all things, according to Ephesians 4, then that means we're going to have to grow up into him in, in the way he loves. It means we're going to have to grow up into him in the way he exercises and demonstrates power. Right? Now, these things we know. But there's also going to have to be a new demonstration of the holiness and purity of God. Because the last thing we want is for people to stand before Jesus and him say, or you tell Jesus, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And he said, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So we need to walk right. Amen? You understand? I, I preach grace, but grace doesn't mean you get to do stuff and get away with it. Grace is the power of God to change. Grace is God's giving you time to change. But you must change. Amen? Now, we come just as we are, but he doesn't leave us the way we are. He changes us into the likeness and image of his son. Amen? And so we're going to, the world is going to have to see that. Now, there's a lot of things going on in the church right now. And those, it's almost as if it's like children playing with things and seeing how far they can take it. And many times they go too far one way and they get in a ditch. Or they go too far the other way and get in a ditch. Now, you can go too far with legalism and get in a ditch, right? You can go too far with grace and get in a ditch. You don't want to frustrate the grace of God. But at the same time, we don't have to get in either ditch. We can walk in the road that Jesus has prepared and just follow him in it. Amen? Amen. Now, in doing that, we're going to have to get some things settled. And over the next three days, really all we're going to do is take all of the traditions of man that we've come up with over the years about healing and the power of God, and we're just going to take them piece by piece and destroy them. All right? Jesus said, he only gave two reasons for failure. One, he said, because of your unbelief. Right? Now, how many of you are unbelievers? No unbelievers? Okay. So basically you're believers, right? So if you're a believer, unbelief is not your problem. Right? Don't, don't even try to get over in the area of where, well, I'm an unbelieving believer. Okay? No, you're not. Okay? Now, he only gave two reasons. One is unbelief. We just decided if you're a believer, you're not an unbeliever, so unbelief is not your problem. The other problem, he said, or the other reason that he gave for failure was he said, by your traditions, you make the word of God of none effect. Isn't that right? So basically, if it's not unbelief, it has to be a tradition. And so, like I said, all we're going to do is take all the traditions of men and destroy them. And that should leave the word of God pure and simple. And when you get just the word of God, it works. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're going to do over the next three days is just destroy those things and just leave you with the word of God specifically concerning power and healing. Now, there's other things. I, I know other things, but that's not why I'm here. Now, we will be taking questions. And a crowd this large, we really can't take questions from the audience because a lot of times we, it just ends up getting you off on a bunny trail and you never get back. And number two, if you ask me a question and I don't repeat it, they won't hear it on the tape or anything, so we have to do it a certain way. So what I'm going to suggest is, and I, I want your questions. By your questions... It helps me to know where you are. Now, part of that, you know, if, if, you're, if you minister much, you can tell where your audience is based on how when you put something out, how it comes back or not, right? If you put it out and it sticks, then we're good. 
okay? If you put it out and it comes back at you and kind of hits you, then you've got to hit that again until that resistance is gone. And so one of the ways that helps me find out where we're at is by you asking questions. So if you have a question, write it down, put it on a piece of paper, and when we take breaks, about every 45 minutes or so, we'll take a break. Then bring the question up, and you can put it probably right on this table here. And then we will get them, because I can tell you, almost, I can almost guarantee that you will not ask a question that we've not heard before. Because everybody has the same questions. Usually, there's about eight to ten categories of questions, and every question comes, falls in those categories. Now, I will tell you, we will answer all of those questions during this training. Right? So, if you want to write your question down, please do. If I look at it, and if it's something we're not going to answer specifically, but it has to do with healing and power, then I will try to answer it, read it, and answer it to you. If it's something we're going to cover in the course, I may not read it directly. I may just answer it as we get to it. All right? But we will cover your questions. Now, please, let's try to stay away from questions that don't have to do with power or healing, okay? I don't care what color your carpet is. Don't care where you put the piano, right? I don't care about any of that stuff, you know? Invariably, people try to ask me about everything else. Uh, people try to ask me about tithing and about... Uh, I'm not here for that, right? I'm here to teach you about the power of God. Now, I will tell you this. <clears throat> faith, when a person speaks faith, Usually, to a religious person, it sounds like arrogance. All right? I don't have time. I, I, I didn't move here. I don't have time to be nice and sweet and gentle. All right? See, if I, if I wanted to make sure I didn't offend you, I could do it. And it might take me you know, an hour and a half to say it, and not offend you. But I don't have an hour and a half to say it. I might have to say it in two sentences, which means you might get offended because I don't have time to make it sweet and nice. All right? But understand, if you know me, this has nothing to do with arrogance, but it is confidence. And it's not confidence in myself, it's confidence in Jesus. I am absolutely confident that he will keep his word. Yes. Amen? Yes. So anything I say, please don't take it to be harsh or mean toward I don't mean that. But I, I refuse to coddle unbelief. All right? Can you tell I've been reading a lot of Wigglesworth lately? <laughs> my, if you want to call him my mentor, um, Dr. Lester Sumrall, who I spent a couple of years with, was trained under Wigglesworth to a degree that he spent a lot of time with him. And of all the men of God I've met, and I've met quite a few now, Dr. Sumrall is still the greatest man of God I've ever met, by far. His life, his ministry, everything, just right. Wasn't known for miracles, even though he had some. But I just want you to understand there were times when I was with Dr. Sumrall that I didn't want to stand within arm's reach because I thought he might slap me because that's just his attitude. He never did, but I you know, sure wasn't sure that he wasn't going to. And I understand that sometimes. And especially when I first start a meeting like this. <clears throat> it's been about uh, three weeks, I guess. About three weeks since I preached publicly in a meeting anyway. And so I've spent a lot of time with God just talking, praying in tongues and just spending time fellowship and reading the word. And so when I first start a meeting, I have to forget that I'm talking to humans. Because God knows when you talk, you can speak straight. But when you talk to humans, if you talk directly, they have a tendency to either get under condemnation or some kind of guilt or something and they don't like correction because it's never pleasant 
But I just want you to understand, if we can get you to a place where those traditions are out of the way, you will walk in the power you've been wanting to. And the more you do, all that stuff you hear about, well, God won't let everybody get healed because you'd, you'd get arrogant or you'd get proud or you know, you'd think you were something. Okay, that's a lie of the devil. You understand? God wants every person healed. Amen. And we were just, as I said, in South Africa. And it was amazing. We were in one meeting specifically that uh, this, <clears throat> they brought this man in. He had HIV. They, on the way to the meeting, they told him, they, they told us they were bringing him. They said, he probably won't make it to the meeting. He's that far gone. Then when they got there, I didn't, there were so many people, there were several thousand people there, and I, didn't, I couldn't tell where he was or anything. But eventually, after I started preaching, I saw him over on the side on a, a pallet on the floor. I knew it was him. I'd, I'd never seen him, but I knew who it was. And then they had another section over here with HIV. But this man was separate on the side. And so I preached, we ministered, had a healing line, went through. Simplest thing, we had uh, about 13 wheelchair cases, I guess, there that were in the line. We had probably probably close to 80 crutches and canes, that kind of stuff, people on crutches and canes. And I started down at the end and just started, it's the simplest thing, just walk down the line, I set you free, I set you free. No long prayer, no screaming, yelling, grabbing, you know, that's all fine, good, whatever it takes for you to get stirred up, it's fine. But I didn't do that, I just walked down the line and said, I set you free, and just touch them. Now, I don't usually do that. If y'all know, I don't usually touch people in the head like that, mainly because I'm short. <laughs> so it's easier just to hold their hands. Okay? You do this very long, you get tired. So, <laughs> but I just went down the line and touched them. And it was amazing because as I, I, I touched them, I said, I set you free. In Jesus' name, I set you free. And then I would just keep moving down the line. And the people on the crutches would just drop their crutches and walk off. I mean, it was just... Boom. Easiest thing you ever saw. Now, the 13 people in the wheelchairs went right down the line, and it was funny because it was the same thing. When I got down to them, I got right, in, right up to them, and I touched them on the head, said, I set you free. Now, get up. And I stepped back, and they would start to move, and they would get up. And by the time we finished, all 13 people had come out of their wheelchair. They, 12 of them left their wheelchair. The only person that left in a wheelchair was a woman who had been out and walking, but she was tired. She was elderly, and she was tired, and they wheeled her out, but she didn't have to, right? It was just a way for her to be rested. That was all 13. By the time we got done, we had a stack of canes, a stack of crutches. We had wheelchairs pushed over, and when I got down to the man, I didn't. <clears throat> I was trying to think what pictures I brought. I brought some pictures, but uh, I, don't, I don't think I brought this one. But anyway, when I got down to the man, he was on the pallet. He literally looked like a... Somebody from Auschwitz. I mean, skeleton with skin stretched over it. That was it. I wasn't even sure he was alive at the time. I, I, he might have died during the meeting. So when I got down to him, I knelt down beside him. I put my hands on his back, and right on his lower back. And I just leaned over to him. I thought I was going to pray. Instead, I just started crying. And then I just looked at him and I said, Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And I stepped back. When I did, he move, that was the first sign of life that I'd seen. We pulled the blanket off of him. He sat up, got up, walked off, and the more he walked, the stronger he got. Wow. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So, <clears throat> now, that's the way it was all across Africa. I mean, literally. One day we went, there was, I, I do house calls all the time. And there was a woman that got out of the, had been in the hospital for cancer, had some serious, uh, well, they said it was going to be ter terminal. But um, she'd had an operation. They brought her home. They wanted us to go pray. Went to her house, prayed for her. She was good and strong by the time we left. We were leaving, having to go up this steep incline on the road. You have to go up and turn around and come back down. As we went up and turned around, we passed another house where there was a woman standing with a cane. And there was a landscaper that was on the, out, out in her yard with her. Matter of fact, if you go on our website and you look under videos or media, media something like that, you can see them there. All the, these testimonies are videotaped. 
You can see them there. And so we stopped and asked this woman, uh, can we pray for you? And she said, okay. Well, her landscaper was standing there, and she told him, because she didn't know us. She wasn't Christian, she, you know, that we know of. I mean, she wasn't, had been in church. They had not requested us to go there. And she, she asked her landscaper, said, would you, would you stay here with me because I don't know these guys? You know, she thought we were going to try to, her word was hijack her. They, they, she was afraid we were going to hijack her. And so she was 67, 68 years old, something like that. And we got over to her. It took about three minutes. Well, no, it wasn't even that. But it was, I'll say three minutes from start to finish. And she had already thrown down her cane and was walking. She had been crippled with arthritis, had got to a point where she stayed in her home, could not come out of her house. For eight months, she had not left her house, could not come outside. That day, she had to because the landscaper was there, and he was trying to find out what she wanted him to do. And so she actually had to come out, and he said it took her 45 minutes just to get out of the house just because she had to walk so slow and was in constant pain. And so whenever she got totally free, this man's name is George. You'll see his, his video on the website also. And he's standing there, and we, said, we started interviewing him. said, you know, do you know this case to be true? Do you know this woman? Was she really sick? Was there really a problem? And he stood there, and he had this big hat on, and, and he, he kind of wiped his forehead, and he, he said, you always hear about this. He said, but you never think you'll see it. He said, but I, I, I saw it with my own eyes. He said, that woman's been in her house, couldn't come outside. We watched this. He said, she's healed. He said, I mean, it, this man started crying because of what he witnessed. And he's on camera. He starts crying, and he turns to walk away because he's a man, didn't want to be seen crying, especially on video. And so he turns and goes and sits in his truck, and he's just sitting there with his hat in his hand thinking about what he just saw. He's not a believer at all. And he's watching this situation. So then I sent Mark over and said, go, go talk to him about Jesus. So this woman said, well, I, I'm healed now. I can go visit my neighbors. She said, if I could just walk down that street, because her road was a 40-degree incline. And she said, I haven't been able to walk down there in years. And we said, well, you can do it now. You're healed. She said, you think so? We said, yeah, we know so. Let's go. So we took off down the road with her. She walked all the way down, all the way back up, and you ought to have seen her. She was so happy. She kept scratching her head and just amazed and said, this is amazing, this is amazing. So we got back. Mark was talking to George, and <clears throat> George came out, and he said, um, there's another, one of my other clients is around the corner. <laughs> She's got arthritis too. <laughs> we said, well, where, where, where is she at? Oh, just right around the corner, less than, less than 10 minutes around. He said, could you go pray for her? I said, yeah, call her and tell her we're coming. So it was me, my daughter, and these other two guys. We just made a day. That's all we did. And we went around to this other woman's house. Went inside of her house. She was cooking. We walked inside. She didn't know who we were. Four, three men and a, and a girl, a woman, walks into her house. She, has, she didn't know who we are. And we walk in, and she's cooking. She got her apron on, and she's standing there, and her hands are like this. And she's trying to hold the thing, and she's cooking. <clears throat> and she said, uh, can I help you? And Kevin Peterson, one of the guys here with me, said, uh, we're here for lunch. <laughs> and you ought to have seen her face, kind of like, what am I going to do? I don't have enough food. <laughs> he said, no, 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 we're just, we're just kidding. We just, George told us about you and said uh, we could come pray for you. And she came in there and was wiping her hands off, and her hands were just literally bent up. And she said, yeah, yeah. And, and I had to go move my car. And then when I come back in, we were talking, they were talking to her a little bit. And they said, so she said, well, I, I know Jesus can do this if I have enough faith. And I said, no, don't worry about that. We're going to have faith for you. Amen. And she said, really? Yep, we'll have faith for you. We're the believers. We're laying hands. We should have faith. And so the amazing thing to me, because I'm used to going places, hospitals and nursing homes and, you know, you name it. I'm used to going there, and you go there with a the crowd. Every time it's the same thing. Everybody's, yeah, let's go do this. And we get there, they, we all look, and they all go, curry. <laughs> so it's really not, let's go do this. It's, let's go watch curry do this, is what usually <laughs> what it comes out. 
But the amazing thing about these guys I was with is that whenever she came out and she's standing there and we're telling her about how Jesus is going to heal her and he's already paid the price, so it's just burned it. We look at each other and if the amazing thing was, we stood there for about maybe 10 seconds and said, okay, who wants to do this? And Mark says, I'll do it. See, it wasn't watch Curry do it. It wasn't, well, who feels the anointing? Who feels the leading? It wasn't that at all. I said, who, who wants to? I'll do it. Okay, and he just stepped, stepped up to her, took her by the hands. He said, arthritis, I command you to leave this woman now. Pain, I command you to go now. Amen. And then he just said, Lord, I thank you for blessing this woman. And you can see the whole thing is on, on the, like I said, on the website. And we got done. She's moving her hand. She just starts crying. I mean, breaking down crying. Her husband was standing in the corner. He started crying because he knew this was real. And he walked over to her, put his arm around her, and she kept saying, Jesus, I knew you could do this. I knew you could do this. <laughs> and it was, all of a sudden, it was like we didn't exist there. It was wonderful. She was just talking to Jesus. I knew you could do this. And, just, and as soon as we said, well, how's that? She goes, I said, there's no pain. There's nothing. There's, and I mean, just totally amazed. And then we said, well, the kingdom of God has come now to you. Amen. And so she said, yeah, yeah, just all excited. And then we said, okay, well, we're going to go. We appreciate you letting us come pray for you. And she said, uh, I got a friend across the street. <laughs> <laughs> so we just spent the whole day going from house to house. 100% were healed. 100%. Nobody stayed sick that day. Amen? Amen? There's other testimonies. The woman, for some reason, it seemed like, too, like arthritis was, that was arthritis week. I mean, it was just, we just blasted it. We had women running up and down steps that had not moved in months. Uh, I mean, you name it. <laughs> Probably the biggest miracle, I mean, I hadn't even mentioned it, and we're actually finishing documenting this now. It's been all over the internet. Our, this was in another town. That was in, um, where was that? That was in Durban, yes. And when we had our healing service in Durban, there was a, uh, a woman that came to us and said, we've been listening to your material, and my daughter wants you to pray for her. I said, okay, well, where's she at? Bring her here. The daughter was a little bashful, and when she came to me, I started talking to her and didn't really notice anything, but whenever she, I said, okay, what, what, what do you want me to pray for you for? And she looked at me like, are you kidding? Because I hadn't noticed. She had no arm from here. It was above the elbow. And I, she said, she held her arm, and I said, okay. So I put my hand. Her, the bones in her arm had fused together into one bone. And she was born this way. This was birth. <clears throat> and it was just above the elbow, so it was up here. She didn't have an elbow. So I put my hand on the end of her arm where I could feel that one bone kind of sharpen in and just stood there for a few seconds and just said, in the name of Jesus, arm, I command you to grow. I said, arm, I command you to grow in Jesus' name. Function correctly, do your job. Now just step back. No hoopla, didn't feel anything. Step back told the mother, I said, go home, get a mar uh, marker, find a way to measure, get a point of reference, mark it, draw it down, measure it, mark the end so that you can see as it grows. And she said, well, she told me later, she said, when you told me that, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> and so she went home that night and did it. Next day, her daughter went to school, and while she was at school, started feeling something in her arm, movement. Her arm started moving. She felt the bones go from a single bone to two bones. It literally break loose inside of her arm. Her other friends, she started talking about what was going on in her arms. Her friends started watching it, and they watched her arm grow out. Right? By the end of the day, her arm had grown over five centimeters. Right? <clears throat> you could see, by the end of the next two days, she had an elbow. Now, I haven't heard again yet, but I know that her arm is still growing. Amen. Now, that went all over, and she came in, the little girl gave her testimony, and the amazing thing was, the funny thing was, 
we told this testimony, and one of the pastors there got up and said, can you imagine the faith that would tell the mother, go home and mark it so you can measure it? And that struck me because I thought, that, I didn't even think like that. Because you know where I got that from? Wigglesworth. Remember? The guy had no feet. Wigglesworth prayed for him and said, tomorrow go buy shoes. And the guy hobbled in on a crutch, had no foot, Told the guy, I want a pair of shoes. The guy thought he was joking. He said, no, I'm serious. Give me a pair of shoes. He went and got the pair of shoes, put it down. When the man put the stump of his leg into it, a foot grew onto it. Amen? Okay, that's where I got the idea of marking it from. Now, did God tell me to do that? Not that I know of. Did, did I hear a voice? Did I have a leading? Nope, not that I know of. But I knew I wanted something for them to be able to measure. This... As long as you think about your faith, you're still thinking about you. You understand? You've got to get your mind off of you. As long as your mind is on you, you will never do much. Because you'll always be thinking, well, I don't know if I have enough faith, don't know if I have enough power, don't know if I have a gift, don't know if I... It's all about you when your mind ought to be on what this person has gone through. Because it's not right. You know, I'm going to send you to break here in just a second. We were talking about this on the way over. How many of you are familiar with John Wimber? Vineyard movement, right? Good healings, one of the first people to start teaching people to activate people in healing and, and, and all this. And yet, he died of, a, of an ailment. And a, his, there was a man named Brian Blount who was head of their healing department in teaching healing in the Vineyard Movement. He came to our DHT in Oklahoma City, or in uh, Tulsa. And we talked at length about John Wimber because he knew him, and I'd never met him. But he said, you know, one of the things about John Wimber is he, the one thing he had a problem with, he, he didn't really believe that physical healing was in the atonement. He said, if you ask him one day, he'd say, yeah, yeah, I think it is. Then you ask him another day, he'd say, but I'm just not sure. So he was always wavering about whether healing is in the atonement. But let me tell you, I don't know of any person that has been used greatly of God in healing that did not believe, ultimately, that divine healing is in the atonement. If you want, I, I can tell you, the, the secret of this is very simple. It, th this stuff is so simple. Really, all it is John Lake said it this way. He said, faith is not a puffing up, but a settling down. I, can, I can't tell you how many people I've met that are always saying things like, I know God's going to heal me. Okay, that's the biggest statement of unbelief you can ever make. Because going to is always future. Whenever by his stripes you were healed. See, most people never settle the fact that healing was provided for in the atonement of Jesus. And if you had those same doubts about salvation, you'd never get anybody born again. So if you need healing, or if you want to minister healing, you're going to have to settle the fact once and for all that healing, as far as God is concerned, is a done deal. It is done. It's established. His word is forever settled in heaven. Psalm 119 verse 89 says, so it's not a matter of you trying to get God to do it or trying to convince God or you trying to get in the right position so God can do it. The bottom line is, you just have to be settled that the word of God is true. And once you do that, it's very simple. Because one thing you'll notice over and over again in these meetings is I'm going to show you beyond any shadow of a doubt the past tense of God's word. It's not future. It's past tense. It's done. And the only reason anybody's still sick is because somebody hasn't exercised kingdom authority to step up and tell that problem that it has to leave that person. Now, we're going to go through a lot of different things. More than likely, at some point, I will hit your pet peeve, right? Your little pet doctrine, your tradition that you like, right? 
All I ask is that you sit through it, listen to it, read the Bible for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Amen? Amen. Don't take my word for it. Settle it. See, you cannot go out and face devils or sickness or disease and say, well, now, Brother Curry says, (laughs) right? I mean, we have an example of that in the book of Acts. And you don't want to be that person. Amen? You have to be able to say, let me tell you something, devil. It is written. Amen? Amen? And once you get it settled, you can't back off. You can never back down. And you'll never quit. Why? Because you don't get beat till you quit. So you just keep on going. You keep on pushing. And you don't. You're going to hear me say a lot of little nugget things. And one of those is that if you're not getting the results that Jesus got, your problem is a tradition that you believe. Right? Bottom line. Now, the only hindrance to healing is the fact that you believe there are hindrances to healing. Once you accept the fact that there are no hindrances, well, yeah, well, what about unbelief? Didn't stop Jesus, didn't stop the apostles. Oh, yeah, in his own hometown, he could do no mighty works there because they're unbelief. No, nope, finish it out. Except he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. So even in the middle of unbelief, Jesus still worked miracles. Amen? They still got healed. Now, we'll go into all these as we go along. But, well, unforgiveness will stop it. Nope. No. Now, you can get healed and remain in your sin. And you'll get healed. But, it'll probably come back on you. Why? Because it gets cast out and walks around and comes back to see if you've been cleaned and filled or just cleaned. Right? So we can get you healed no matter what. There is not one thing I have found that stops the power of God. Well, sin will stop the power of God. Well, if that's true, nobody's saved. Right? Because you were all sin, and Jesus saved you anyway. Well, why? Because where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. Amen? Amen? The goodness of God draws men to repentance. God will heal people and set them free. And you say, well, what if they're not going to serve God afterwards? What's that to you? It's not your call. He said, freely you receive, freely give. He didn't say pick and choose. He didn't say choose the people who deserve it. Jesus never used healing as a coercion. You understand? He never said, if you want to get healed, get saved first. If you get saved, I'll heal it. No, he said very clearly. He said, He would set them free, get them healed, and then say, now, go and sin no more. In other words, I've already proven to you the power is real, now don't remain in your sin, right? He didn't tell them to get the sin out first, right? So we're going to hit all these things this week, and the beauty of it is when we get done, it's going to work for you. Amen? Amen. I got a pastor friend of mine that he's actually pastoring the church. We, We just started a church in Denver. And he is my right-hand man in JGLM, actually. And gets results. Awesome man of God. His name is Joe Fanaro, as a matter of fact, if you see him on our website. And he was in... I'm trying to think of where... He, he was in Kenya, I think it was. Yeah. And <clears throat> he, there was a pastor there who had a child who was very young. don't remember the age, but very young. And the child was not saved... And the child was actually causing some problems for the pastor. And one day at, during the meetings, the pastor said, pray for my child. And so Joe just called her up right in front of everybody. Called her up. Started praying for her. Said, now do you know Jesus? She said, no. He said, do you want to? She said, yeah. So he just led her to Jesus right there in front of everybody. And then he said, now watch. And he turned around and he, he said, who in here?" Actually, there were four people there that were very in very bad condition physically. And he was fixing to pray for them. And so he just called. He said, you four people, come down here. And he said, now watch. You do it. He j- just got this girl born again. Just, I mean, we're talking a minute before. He said, now, put your hand on her. Put your hand, tell the little girl, put your hand on these people. Now say this. Now do this. She did it, and all four were instantly healed. Amen? Now, that proves this isn't tenure. This isn't how long you've been doing this. Right? All it comes down to is, see, the good thing is she didn't know enough to unbelieve. 
she hadn't been taught enough. Right? So she'd, yeah, okay, say that, okay, and she'd say it and did it. Now, so that's why I said, that's why it takes usually about three days to get all this done, is because we have to work through all the things that you believe that aren't right. See, there, there's two types of potters, two types of sculptors. There's a sculptor that you take clay, and then you keep packing on clay until it looks like what you want. Right? That's the way most Christians try to do. Well, here I am, but I need an anointing. I need a gift. I need this. I need that. I need to be fixed. I need inner healing. I need, you see, always packing on more clay. That's not the kind of sculptor that you're supposed to be or that God is. You're supposed to be the kind of sculptor that takes a big block of marble, sees Jesus in it, and then chips away everything that isn't Jesus. You understand? You don't need anything added to you. You just need some stuff chipped away. And what we found over the last 10 years, this will be my 10th year in full-time ministry doing this, what I'm doing. In those 10 years, like I said, we've trained over 40,000 people. I've prayed, I quit pray, I quit counting after we prayed for over 70,000 people personally. And over those 10 years, we were just talking the way in, um, we've never taken a vacation. De- meaning, I'm not saying I'll never get a day off, but I'm just saying we've never gone anywhere where I didn't have a phone on, that wasn't ringing, somebody calling, something, I was always available. And the reason I'm saying this is because the need is so great that there's always somebody trying to die somewhere. There's always something happening. So the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. And the tradition in the church, the teaching in the church has kept the laborers few because you think you have to be something special or something. And all I'm telling you, you have to be, you just have to be available. You have to be bold. You have to be compassionate. Amen? Amen. Real simple. And we're going to get all that other stuff out of you and then you're going to get busy. Amen? Amen? You just don't take no for an answer if it's a Bible promise. Amen?